Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Bennett. I'm from Televisual. Uh, welcome to our session, uh, exploring the importance of a managed HDR colour pipeline. Uh, with the idea here is to give you practical advice and some guidance. I'm joined with an amazing panel, uh, people I've worked closely with uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, let's start with Asa Scholl, uh, colourist from uh, Warner Brothers to Lane Lee. Asa is an incredibly accomplished uh, colourist, has an incredible credit list, perhaps best known for Netflix The Crown, where he's done all seasons. Uh, he's also done FX's Debs recently, for which he won an award, or two, I think. And also recently TX Netflix Behind Her Eyes, which isn't HDR, the others are, um, and Mission Impossible um, as well. And crikey, it's, uh, the, the list is very long and very illustrious. Uh, Tom Mitchell, uh, technical director from Mission, joins us as well. Uh, Mission are responsible for some of uh, the, the most high profile HDR productions um, in uh, you know, shooting in the UK and around the world. Uh, recent credits include Netflix's Rebecca, which I thought was superb, um, I hasten to add, and shouldn't be compared to Hitchcock. Uh, Netflix Enola Holmes and also Netflix Emma, among others. We're also joined by Paco Ramos, uh, who is Mission's new head of colour. Uh, he also has a great track record um, with colour supervision, including Amazon's Unfortunate Stories, Amazon's, I hope I got this right, Ache, and... Uh, Netflix, it's a Netflix show. Yeah, and movie stars Reyes de la Noche. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we want to catch yeah. the session at a reasonable pace and cover up as many touch points as we can. And if all goes to plan, to try and contain it within the hour, if not 45 minutes. It's not for lack of items to discuss. There's lots here and there's lots that comes from it. It's out of respect for your time. Uh, to note, and it's an important note at this point, this session is being staged by Televisual and Mission and sponsored by Sony and Leader in Electronics. That is, this is not an, uh, this is an editorial piece based on expert knowledge from our panelists, none of whom are being paid to be part of this panel. It's a really important key point. Their observations and their guidance here are their opinions. These are not sponsored opinions, they're their opinions. It's also no coincidence that Sony and Leader Instruments want to uh, sponsor this event. Uh, both are gold, gold standard vendors for HDR monitoring and test and measurement, and both have enviable uh, market shares within that space. And also a big shout out to Big Pit Media and Bam Pro for supporting the event. The demand for HDR and more often 4K HDR is, is accelerating and it's accelerating rapidly in both the UK and US. It's driven by the streamers, it's driven by home cinema, for Netflix, Amazon, Apple and many others. Full frame, large format, uh, HDR can be just as unforgiving. Clipped highlights look more clipped and noise in the shadows looks much, much, much worse. Many have likened HDR to a new paint palette, a new color palette, but perhaps it is better thought of as a more sensitive canvas on which to project light and color. And when done well, when done well brings a more vivid and immersive experience. HDR requires different choices, different production protocols and changed workflows. And these choices, protocols, and workflows are still maturing and gaining traction across the community. The ambition for this session is to speed up the adoption of current best practice by identifying where things go wrong, how to avoid them, and how technology can help. Our agenda, to rise above the compartmentalized, it's a big word, compartmentalized view of production workflow and try to look at HDR color management as one continuous joined up process from prep through delivery and so better realize the director's creative intent, which is what all of my panelists are here to do. And with the judicious use of technology in the right hands, this approach should save money that can better be spent on creativity for a better final result. So it's, you know, it's about spending, as my old chairman used to say, your job is not to save money, it is to spend it wisely. Right, we're gonna crack on. Uh, we're going to start, I hope, in a fairly uh, uh, understandable, comprehensive, comprehensible um, approach, which is we're going to start with what are the issues? Uh, what happens when it goes wrong? And I'm going to start with Tom and just say, Tom, what's wrong with monitoring in 709? Why is that, why is that an issue? 
Well, I think as time comes, uh, you know, as time goes by, we're basically now seeing more and more content in um, as a HDR deliverable. And we're obviously seeing a significant amounts of content in multiple deliverables, um, whether it's on your um, iPhone, which, you know, most of the iPhones now are all, um, and the iPads are all HDR as well. The, the issue is, is with, um, it's basically with the sort of the contrast of the scene that you're not basically getting a sense of I would I would always say seeing is believing particularly with the you know the highlights so I take it I often sometimes show people an example where you've got a candle against a wall and um, when you're looking in a 709 monitor the candle looks just as bright as the reflection or the hot spot on the wall and yet when you look at it in HDR monitor the candle is so much considerably you know so much brighter than the wall and sometimes that can actually be distracting now if you're a cinematographer you might actually if you saw that instantly you'd walk in you'd instantly know that it's a problem and you would go right what can I do about that to fix it and you just don't get that sense without having some sort of HDR monitoring on set or or, 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 or measurement equipment that can also show you that uh, I'm going to hand over to Asa and bring us all in here but Asa We've talked about the crown many, many times. Um, one surprise I've always found is that you you you, uh, you, you cap the nits at four hundred nits. Um, how does this translate to the shoot? What 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 what's how do you define and 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 retain that nit level in the shoot? What do you do? What do you say? Well, uh, we didn't exactly go four hundred, but we found that four hundred almost nothing went over that, and in fact the majority was about one hundred eighty nits. So it's not like an incredibly uh, using the high dynamic range uh, in its extreme. Um, what we did was basically after season one and two, which were just SDR deliverables, and there's the mistake, uh, we remastered them. We were asked to remaster them around the time we were doing season three for HDR. Um, and in those, because they'd already set the look and no one was used to HDR, the creatives, we pretty much kept it almost in that um, SDR mode and just let some of the highlights come through at a very low, low level but what we did notice there was that the clipping that had occurred in some windows which was a creative decision on season one or two um became distracting I, I, you know a clip level probably as the, the viewers can see that the light behind um james we're losing detail and it's brighter than his face and his shirt's clipping slightly and those things um become um ugly in a way or Americans would say egregious or distracting or look like video rather than film. So when um, Adriano Goldman, the, the uh, main cin cinematographer, and I started on doing prep for season three, we looked at those and he actually, uh, in viewing uh, his test HDR, could see that he could put more um, silks on the windows, uh, he could light foregrounds more and take everything down. He even did on season four, under exposure passes at the end of a take for windows and shot curtains and things so that if they were clipped we had things that we could come back in and, and fix them so those were the things that helped us on season three and four and on season three because we graded HDR first the creatives got more used to that range and it went up to sort of three four hundred in places without uh, people sort of leaping for their sunglasses or, or finding it distracting. Now, going back to those windows though as well I'm thinking about um, HDR monitoring on set yeah. And what are you seeing in the grade? If, it's, if, it, if that window is shot and they're looking at a Rec 709 monitor, yeah. what, what, what can happen when you get into the grade in HDR? Well, when, when you get into the grade, you do realise that it's much brighter than SDR. It could be great, could be used for effect. Often there, if there is detail there, it's fantastic. Skies look absolutely incredible. Um, but if it's much brighter, then the face or the person in the foreground will appear to be darker. Or if you want to make things less bright, you bring it down. You have to play with it. You're going to key it. You're going to flatten it off. You're going to, you know, different approaches. So it's more of being fixed rather than being massaged or being right in the first instance and just working on other aspects within that frame. Uh, so HDR monitoring on set um, is brilliant and would be brilliant if more people did it because they can adjust, uh, like Tom was saying with the candle um, story, to, to get the image they're capturing closer to what we're finally going to grade. Um, and it is mainly that clipping of highlights in practicals or in windows, uh, or things just being distracting that, that you really can see on the set um, if you want to do HDR. Can I ask a question to Asa Shell uh, about mm. that? Um, when, when you deal with those, with those moments, with, with those uh, moments where actually there's a huge contrast that we you, you couldn't see in, in SDR, 
do you sometimes have to make the decision of bringing everything within SDR levels? So in, in a HDR format, in an HDR deliverable, bring it all in SDR levels. So it actually is less uh, distracting and actually the contrast ratio is similar to the SDR ones. Um, I don't think I've ever had to bring it all the way in as it were, if there's windows or, mm -hmm. or details that are bright, if they're tiny little bright things that then look like laser points through like car headlights in the distance, we would use a texture highlight to diffuse those slightly, which will soften them and not make them look so piercing. But large, yeah, large areas of brightness, you, you might bring everything down and then key or lift faces back up or just a combination of keys and curves um, to get them closer together. Um, whereas you might accept that sky being that bright if the foreground or the, the character or whatever it was was, was closer to it and, and might maybe be over 100 nits as well. Thanks. Back to that, I think I'm back to that idea of my headlights actually which you mentioned there. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've heard from people who shot using HDR monitoring um, is that suddenly you're much more aware of those background light sources yeah. and more to the point you might be able to paint out that background light source but then you can't paint out the ambient light that's thrown from for example car headlights um, and this is again the importance of that HDR monitoring on set and, and, and Acer and again you know, this is something I know you feel quite strongly about um, in terms of that massaging the shot or understanding the shot in the context of the grade in HDR um, yeah. as an important point. Yeah, I think that that's it is if you, I think you, your brain, your eye can realize very quickly uh, looking at an image, if something's wrong with it, if something's had to be done, if it looks graded or manipulated, the curve doesn't look right, uh, the light falling on things or backlight has been pulled down. Um, and you, you see it all the time. It's probably equivalent to someone doing a sound mix where something was distorted and they've had to you know, do ADR. I always seem to be able to hear ADR or sometimes sound effects and Foley are really over obvious. And it's to those things as well, visually. Um, I mean, you can have things graded quite bizarrely as a look and it still works within the narrative and the story, um, but it's when you've had to fix certain images. Um, the, the classic one is, is backlight, car headlights with someone in the foreground who just disappears or flares out. And you're right, if you fix one thing in the background, you, your brain is like, what's all this happening? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so yes, it's, it, it's the education of HDR with, with, with DPs mainly, um, and to help them try and realize on set what that new range will do. Sometimes it's fantastic and they use that for effect. They want a dark figure against a bright sky. That can be really powerful. And if I can, I'm just taking the antithesis of this. Tom, I, 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 isn't the problem every bit as great in, in, in underexposing as well? Um, yeah, exactly. So with HDR, it, you know, a lot of people, we talk about the highlights a lot, but we don't actually really talk about um, so much the mid and the shadow so much. When you're, when you're sometimes treating low contrast scenes, like you could take, for example, like the candlelit stuff, you know, where you're in a nice warm fire, um, you're normally pushing the camera to its limits. You know, the cameras are typically daylight balanced. Sometimes you're pushing pushing um, the camera by a stop or so, and you're losing about two thirds of a stop because it's tungsten lighting. And that's something on a Serena Monta can look a little bit noisy and you just think, well, if I just tweak the blacks and crush them a bit, it'll mm. be fine. Mm. But then as soon as you just play it on a HDR monitor and you start, you know, you start applying the grade and you're, 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 you're adjusting the contrast, you basically, um, all of a sudden, you just see this huge amount of noise floor that you wouldn't have normally seen on an SDR monitor. And again, just by staring straight in front of the monitor, uh, on a HDR monitor, having one right there in front of you, you immediately see the problem and you can, if you can see it, you can, you can fix it um, right then and there. Um, I, you know, and also with with monitoring equipment, it often shows up on the monitoring equipment, like uh, on the set of scopes. You can see the little um, line at the bottom, and you can see that line get fatter and fatter as you start to um, really push the image as well. So, you know, without those tools, you don't know about it until you get into into grade, and you've, you've got like um, you know, Aces sort of trying to trying to um, you know massage the image or, or trying to inform the DP softly about the bad bad news about the image. So. We always want to know. We all, no one wants to be in that situation. We want to avoid it up front. So you know, I can't can't say enough why it's important to monitor from the get go. I can't. I cannot begin to express just how much noisier noise is in HDR compared to an in SDR. In SDR, you know, I'm an ace will be better informed than I am here. But in SDR, 
you can crush that plaque potentially and get away with it. But in HDR, you're just left with that noise, which, which if you turn that into a crushed plaque, suddenly turns into quite a weird scene. Would that be right, Ava? Yeah, you also get problems when you try and treat it in certain ways that if you denoise it, uh, then you often on broadcast, you get a kind of solarizing or posterizing effect. And sometimes we add a tiny minute bit of grain to dither that. Um, but it is about, it, it always comes back to monitoring, you know, building LUTs beforehand, testing these cameras. Last week did two different camera formats against each other because uh, the DP wasn't used to the one that they were, which was a Sony Venice that he was going to be using uh, at all different exposure levels and, you know, ND and over and under, you know, various stops. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's all, always informative, but it was like, oh, crikey, when we go to that level at that, you know, ISO setting, we get huge amount of noise in the shadow. So then put it on this one and you'll, you know, clean it up or put some more light in. Yeah. And again, isn't it, isn't it all, I'm, I'm, where do you start on any production? I'm, how do you start and how do you plan and how I'm thinking about it from the working backwards from the deliverables? What does that mean to you, Asa, before you go into that? Well, that's what we always do. I mean, we call post-production, but we, we're pre now and we have to be. It's script stage, testing stage, but we always start with the deliverables, um, which can be quite complicated. Different streaming services and broadcasters have different requirements, both for what they're going to broadcast and what they want to archive. Uh, so you start with those, uh, usually a larger working format possibly than you're going to deliver. Uh, cinema might still be 2K, uh, uh, you're going to be UHD for most streaming services, but then they might want the camera native or an extra 5%. So you want to be very careful about what you're going to be shooting on, uh, how you're going to be capturing the image if it's large enough. Um, colour space as well and colour pipelines, which we've been through before, like with ACES and things, but then it's like, um, once those are approved at the deliverable stage, and we're happy with that, we, we're then with the DP camera testing so that they know what to capture, what kind of format. Um, then we would check with the main visual effects vendor. Hopefully one is on board by that time because they might say, oh, we only want to work at 2K or we're going to work at 239. They were like, well, we have to deliver open gate or something. So you have to do that. Or they talk to production about possibly working at 3K or higher on those visual effects. Um, Again, it's a tough one because all the deliverables might not be anything higher than SDR HD to begin with, but you'll be pretty sure that within a year, two or three or however long or during production, someone will say, we're gonna need HDR. Having done that with a VFX vendor, we also include dailies um, to make sure that they're happy with those pipelines. So there's lots of back and forth, making sure that everyone's on the same page before you start filming. Um, so, so think about, think about the creation of the LUT and the LMTs. Um, yeah. this is, you know, think about the creation of that LUT with working with the cinematographer. I and mean, what are you doing in the prep room? Are you are you looking at HDR monitors? Are you looking at are you looking at them in every single permutation? And, and are you testing those images? And yeah, and, that's that's then, what we'll be doing. Well, depending on the yes, I mean it, it's basically yes. If it's a TV show, you're straight to HDR. I can monitor HDR and SDR at the same time in my suite, and you, you're looking at them on both. Um, if it's a feature film, it's probably projected P3, but then it's after that going through the lens choices or camera makeup, whatever you're there doing, you would say, okay, let's have a look at it in HDR. And this is another thing we do for visual effects. Are visual effects aware they're working, in, they need to work HDR, they need to check their images, because if you're working in, in, in on visual effects, you're not going to be able to afford 300 HDR monitors, I would imagine. Uh, so we often host VFX checks during, during filming, months before we're actually going to degrade anything, projected, you know, P3, and then check them in HDR to see if anything's broken, if you can see a huge light through the window that's actually on a crane, all these things that will come up uh, to try and steer them away from having to be you know, fixed later on or, or any problems. Well, absolutely. And I think and you touched upon something there, which is that, you know, HDR monitoring is believable in various points on the curve. We're going to come on to that, I think. But... But at the same time as that, with VFX, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, an expensive um, line item. As um, yes. three hundred, you know, ten k, let alone thirty k monitors, it, it starts to become uh, unbelievable. So again, thinking about um, how you how you achieve those images in HDR, um, and what 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 you're looking for in that prep room. I can come back to you, Asa, first of all, and Tom kind of pass on to you here. You know, what are you looking? What are you testing for? What are you testing for those images? Um, 
firstly, we want to, well, it depends sort of what the test is. So we'll probably have camera tests and lens tests, hair and makeup, and then hopefully location. And at each stage, they're, they're slightly different, but um, you want the cinematographer and director, whoever's with you, to be aware of what they're capturing and what they might need to capture or be aware of for the kind of look they're going for for that story. It's all got to be story led, it's got to work the narrative, you've got to enhance uh, where you're directing the eye, where you don't want the eye to be directed. I mean, we've, I've done productions where we've deliberately made things sort of just off the edge of screen, very bright, because the whole point is those actors, the cast were in the dark and enlightenment was just beyond them. But most of the time it's about faces. Almost every scene, actors are gonna be talking and you want to see them. Um, and rather than have to do lots of work vignetting or sorting things out later, you, you want as good, if you like, a negative to begin with. Uh, you almost want it to feel like those beautiful days when they only ever could go to the lab with their print. So they were given pre-light days, which I don't think even exist anymore, um, because they had to get it right those cinematographers just had to nail it. Now we've got more tools to help. I think they've almost been given less time to do that because producers and other people, cinematographers themselves, know they can solve those problems later, flag off a wall, brighten an eye, whatever it might be. Um, but it's really to try and direct them through this path of choices to make sure that they've got everything they need, including making LUTs, which we might go on to. Um, and, and that's another thing with LUTs is, you might want, the show might want a golden look and you might make them a golden LUT or they might do it in, in you know, hopefully in lighting, but you don't want anything to be hidden. You don't want to create any look that's so powerful during the process that it's going to hide problems. And if you change your mind later on, reveal things that, that, that were hidden during that process. I'm going to come back at that a second because I remember um, thinking about gold uh, you know, immediately it springs to mind your work with Rob Hardy on Debs. And, uh, you know, and Rob, um, one of my favourite quotes from Rob is, you know, you find your film in the prep room. To what extent is the colour, uh, the colour balance that you're finding in the prep room, the LUTs and the LMTs you're creating in the prep room, to what extent are you finding, are they getting closer and closer to what you're delivering at the back end now? Is there a, or, or are they a LUT that's just there as, as a shooting guide, as a shooting principle? Oh, it really varies. It really does. I'm sort of, with some productions, steering away from a LUT with a certain look so that the cinematographer is confident that they're seeing what they're capturing. Um, other times, they will want a very bold look on something because that's what they really have decided they want and they don't want execs or anyone to be shocked by that later on. So, you know, they want everyone on board, which is always good to do. You don't want battles later. You want some options, possibly. Um, but it is great when you strike upon that combination of the way it's being lit and graded and, you know, visual effects and everything and everyone's in that thing and it carries that through all the way. That's, that's like being able to pre-light something and get it right in the camera to begin with. And you'll probably never get it looking better than that. You know, you just, in, it, it's better to be able to enhance and play with things and be able to take it in different directions rather than have to salvage anything or fix anything. That's why I remember years ago, a DP saying he didn't like the term color correction because it inferred that there was something wrong to begin with. Yeah, you know, they, they liked color enhancement, which is what we hope we're doing rather than correcting anything. Tom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over to you, Tom, because I think it's kind of a natural thing. And this, now this isn't an ACES session, but yeah, Tom- I'll yeah. have a break. <laughs> <laughs> we have other films we can direct you to for ACES. This isn't an ACES session. Tom, tell me about, um, you're a big advocate of ACES though, and this kind of ties into our theme today. Why, why are you such a big advocate of ACES? Uh, I mean, as a company or internally, I mean, uh, we sort of talk about um, ACES by default unless told otherwise. So, you know, um, we've done some shows recently with ACER um, and we've had that opportunity to have that dialogue, but so often um, we were actually having this conversation before the stream, we don't have that dialogue. Um, so it's important to set some sort of standard. ACES is a well-known standard that virtually every post-production company knows. Now, you can make up any what's called colour-managed workflow, but you need a colour-managed workflow of some form in order to deal with the fact that you've got multiple inputs and multiple different deliverables. Um, so you've got to have some sort of intermediary space and, and, and for something to go into that and, and to go out of it. ACES is already built. It's designed for the job. It, it does have, you know, obviously nuances which 
are still being worked on. There's going to be like Exis 2.0 and, you know, it's been iterated on. But everybody in well, the vast majority of the industry are all inputting on that. So it is a is a good starting point, even though you might have to, you know, for certain scenarios, um, fudge the edges where it doesn't work. But at least it's a standard everyone knows. Otherwise, if you go and pick one that's designed by a specific post company, then there's a huge amount of work educating all the different um, stakeholders on that way of working. So for us, if we haven't got the post company and the other other stakeholders involved when we, we, we get involved, then we just set up an ACES pipeline by default unless otherwise told. Yeah. And, and okay, so I'm, I'm thinking about this, you know, there was a time, and this is one thing I would want to comment on ACES, and it's a brief comment, there was a time when ACES was believed to be quite prescriptive and, and was quite prescriptive. And I was talking to, I did a session recently on his plant materials with um, uh, which mission we're involved with, which was uh, Sam Chinnaworth over at Technicolor. And he was, and he'd done Lego, all the Lego franchise. Um, and he was one of the first people to adopt and work with ACES. And he, and he was saying that the change in version two is, is just phenomenal. And what he was able to do and how he was able to take Jean-Clement Soray's curves from, from season one and apply them within an ACES pipeline in season two, season one wasn't, and, and actually have the malleability and the grade to still work with it. And I think there's a, a slight misconception about ACES that it is entirely prescriptive and takes you down one channel from which you can't escape. I'm ACER with that. And, we were talking about um, we were talking about aces earlier and some of the shortfalls there, but isn't that the case? And 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 also, if I can, Ace, to prompt you on Ari, which we were talking about earlier. Um, yes, no, just to, just to echo really what Tom was saying with aces, it's pretty much the first thing we write down, even though there are other workflows or DRTs you might use where you prefer different response to the shadows, etc. Trying to remember the question. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's about it's about, uh, it's about why Aces. Why is Aces you know, thinking about this managed color pipeline? Why is Aces designed? Well, when we've gone other routes, which have been work for most people, you often get a VFX house popping up and saying, "No, we, you know, we want to go Aces. We don't want to go Ari linear with things or, or whatever." Or if you're doing, I don't know, Red IPP two as a DRT or some other route, or you've just created your own one, um, then you have to create IDTs and ODTs for everyone and they better work because if they don't, you're the company that sort of demanded or, or whether, that you've worked a certain way. Um, it's recognized by all the streaming services everyone you're going to deliver to. So it's, it's really the easiest way, as Tom says, to make sure there's not gonna be any surprises um, and anyone joining the party late, because that happens, um, isn't gonna have a problem with it. Um, Ari, with Ari, the only thing with Ari and Aces is the primaries and the blues are outside that. So with neon, blue neon signs um, or blue flares, they will break up. Now there's a, an LMT that you can just add to the processing dailies and in the gray that's even on the Aces website. We've got our own, but they've got one that you can use that, that, that completely sorts that problem out. But it's the odd thing like that that has come up for a DP a couple of years ago or an effects house or whoever it may be with it. And then they say, oh, ACES, you know, you can't use ACES with Aries or something and it's nonsense. Um, yeah. I think what's, what's quite good about ACES is that it's an iterative, iterated format. It's basically, it's improved on and that multiple, multiple people are working on it so there's absolutely obviously no known known issues with it um you know with the you know, saturation issues it's already something that's been highlighted to fix in um 2.0 and there's some really interesting discussions uh, if you you know you go on the um uh, on the aces website you can you can kind of follow that um with some really interesting solutions on how they're solving those outer gamut issues um as well as also uh, there's been a lot of you know talk about the um the rt that's basically the thing that kind of gives you the default 709 look or whatever yeah. is obviously very aggressive and i think they they're going to tackle that because they just basically want to make sure they put put back that creative freedom but but the, you know the, the, it comes down to the thing is is it's a it's a working standard of which you know that if you choose it um you're not going to have any major problems down the line as if you kind of make something up then you, you are responsible for making sure that every single stakeholder gets it right and very often they don't first time. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to hand over here to Paco as well. Um, Paco, you've been very quiet here, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what, what's the colour supervisor and the daily's perspective on uh, on setting up on the show lights and the LMTs? What's, what's so, 
So normally what um, I would do or what we would do at admission is if Acer, for example, has set a look for a particular show and we are going to do all the dailies processing and we're going to have our DITs on set uh, working uh, with the uh, production. Um, th the first thing that we do is obviously uh, take care that that LMT is uh, applied correctly across to any uh, device or any camera that uh, we might be working with. Um, sometimes uh, uh, production starts with a single very well-defined camera source that, uh, that the, they're going to work, but Later on during production, they might add a secondary camera, a B camera, a C camera, or even they would add uh, GoPros or some other cameras to actually get um, a particular shot uh, to depending on the story they want to tell. So uh, what we do is uh, we take care that all those cameras tie into the workflow uh, properly and correctly. And if there's any lock boxes that um, the production might want to use or the DOPs want to use. Obviously, we create uh, the LUTs for those LUT boxes so they work um, uh, properly. And also, uh, in the end, what we try to do is uh, um, make um, the DOP comfortable during uh, production so they can actually see what they intended from the very beginning, from prep and they can focus uh, on the creative decisions. So we are there to kind of be the technological um, partner of uh, the DOP and kind of help them with all the technical hassle and uh, sort it out for them. So that's mostly try to kind of brief explain it. That would be, that would be it. Obviously we would always, um, as Asa Schultz said at the beginning, be very wary of what the deliverables are at the end. So, uh, and speaking of resolution before, the reason maybe we, we would go for ASIS is, is because it's the largest container there as well. It's a non-destructive uh, framework that actually would give us the flexibility to uh, change if we have to in the future. So uh, that is mostly it. So what we would uh, try to work from our color supervision role. And would you be and would you be going backwards and forwards with the post house at this point and uh, and and to what extent are they is that what's that line of communication like what we would try to have uh one uh, very thorough and deep conversation where uh we obviously highlight how the workflow is going to be what decisions are taken sometimes might happen that um uh, the director might uh, the the dop might want uh several lmts or several looks so we have to adjust that and obviously uh, that is an exponential uh, uh for us it will have an exponential impact because if the three cameras or uh, two cameras if there is a new LMT or a secondary LMT, we have to do twice as many uh, uh, LUTs for all the uh, devices involved. Um, we also try to have conversations with Post to uh, kind of have uh, very clear any instructions that they might have on how we, uh, they want to treat uh, dailies. Um, for example, sometimes they might say, we, we really want to treat uh, the dailies here with a third of a stop uh, in the CDLs. So we will instruct the DITs and the lab operators to follow that uh, decision um, during uh, the dailies um, rendering and production. So that would be it. And again, and at that point, you're, you're working with um, both monitors and, and scopes on set and scope mm -hmm. is very, very common on set. Yeah. Um, and we've got a short film um, that yeah. you kindly <laughs> shot for us yesterday, I think. Uh, yeah. And I, I think I think it's uh, let's see a bit of technology here, and let's see let's see what what uh, Paco's talking about. And we're going to hear Paco's voice, but this time recorded, although you might be hearing it recorded. Tom. Uh, okay, over to VT. HDR production is consolidating, and we know this because we see more and more DOPs and DITs that are shooting their first HDR shows. Mm. HDR monitoring on set would be ideal. Something like the Sony BVM-171 would be uh, very well suited for uh, on-set operation. Something like the Sony HX310 that I have right behind me is more suited for a grading suite. We can also add the analysis capabilities of leader scopes. With leader scopes, what we could do is activate an HDR mode that would help DOPs and DITs take informed decisions while they're crafting their images. For example, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate the HDR mode. 
we're going to turn it on and choose firstly the standard that I'm going to work on. In this case, if I'm going to deliver a Dolby Vision Master, I would choose PQ. Then what I could do is set the upper limit of um, my uh, readings of the scopes. I could go up to 10,000 nits, which is how the PQ um, curve was uh, designed, or 4,000 nits, which is actually the Dolby Vision um, mastering format. But the display that I have in front of me, the Sony HX310, um, goes up to 1,000 nits, and that's actually the level that I really want to analyze. So I, ch I activate it. And then in reference levels, I have the option of going to 51% or 58%. The reason this uh, uh, happens is because 51% was uh, how initially the PQ uh, signal was designed to set diffuse white on 100 nits. When we set it at 58%, we follow the latest recommendation to go up to 203 nits of diffuse white. Once I complete this, I could see that uh, the, my leader scope starts to uh, show the different nit levels to the right of uh, the scope. And one mode that I'm going to um, enable right now is the CineZone mode. What I'm going to do here is actually turn on a false color mode where we're going to see displayed a color pattern where everything that is uh, that goes from black to white is what is going to be considered within the SDR levels. Uh, this is from 0 to 203 nits. And anything that uh, starts from the blue uh, color, where we have um, the 203 nits of diffuse white uh, defined, anything that goes beyond that will have a color pattern. For example, in this shot, we could see that almost everything is within the SDR uh, limits, but we can see that the, uh, the headlights especially are starting to peak around 600 uh, and uh, almost 700 nits. This could really help DOPs and DITs to actually uh, define how they would work with the exposure uh, while they're on set. If we go to a night shot over here, we can see uh, how um, in this particular shot the torch of our character is the only element that is going uh, beyond uh, the SDR uh, threshold. So actually we could start to design creatively the storytelling with how uh, we set um, our images over uh, diffuse white. I do recommend that uh, you start to develop an eye for HDR imagery to analyze the pictures that uh, you've shot with your colorist to go into the grading suite and see how uh, the uh, waveform uh, is displayed and how uh, the signal is represented in HDR. That would really help you to uh, develop an eye for HDR and start to defining in the future different levels of diffuse white or a different threshold for peak brightness depending on the story that you want to tell. Is HDR monitoring mandatory? Well, I definitely think that HDR uh, monitoring is really helpful to judge our HDR uh, images. I do think that we can't always control the viewing environments uh, on set and they definitely never go to meet the standards of HDR gradient uh, suites as uh, they are built. So I do think that having the possibility of uh, adding a leader scope into our production would really help us to objectively judge the images and help us make better creative decisions for our HDR productions. Well, we're back in the rooms. Uh, thank you, Paco, and welcome back, Paco. Um, thank you. So, on and off, we're going to turn to you first here. Um, we're going to look at wh why is HDR monitoring important across the chain, uh, and where is it, and um, where should it be most applied? Paco, starting with you, um, you know, where should be it, where should it be applied? 
Well, uh, definitely, I, I do think, uh, as I said in the video, that uh, it is going to be really beneficial uh, to have it uh, on set. Um, having those uh, instances where you're really not sure uh, where your exposure is and uh, kind of uh, double checking that um, what you're seeing in HDR um, is actually uh, the best result you could get. And uh, obviously that is going to translate properly in SDR later down the, uh, down the chain is actually really key. Uh, one thing that uh, I didn't mention in, in the video, for example, is obviously you have, you have to have uh, your color pipeline uh, spot on here. Uh, something that might happen is that uh, uh, you would have, you would still have some SDR monitoring uh, on set, obviously, but you would have to prepare an HDR output for um, uh, uh, these monitors. So actually we need to be also very sure, and, and that would be the job of the color supervisor, that in that pipeline, we set the uh, collect, uh, the correct um, um, output transform to the monitor. So we are actually sure that what we're viewing is what we're going to get later in post. So, um, and I think that is uh, the key of this is that you really want to um, prevent, or, well, not, not prevent, but you really wanna uh, highlight things that might pop up uh, during uh, the shoot that later on could be inherited by the VFX team or later on uh, maybe uh, the colorist might have to take care of. And obviously you would want to do that in, in HDR. If you do that in SDR, you wouldn't know what's going on and no one would flag it until um, maybe someone like Ace Show uh, starts uh, working on the grade and uh, suddenly realizes that something was wrong. So Asa, I'm, I'm, from your perspective, I'm, it's, it's a given, right? You're working in HDR. Um, yeah. yeah. No, it's very interesting what uh, Becca was saying because I looked at some rushes the other day in HDR um, for a project we're working on. And it was an airport and there appeared to be, firstly in SDR, beautiful sun coming through backlit. And then I noticed in HDR that those were big 20K lights on um, cherry pickers because you'll see all of that. You can't be hidden. Um, and then I actually was just flagged that to editorial that they needed to probably flag that to VFX that they're gonna to have to remove them, um, which you wanna know ahead of time, uh, possibly on set would be great. Uh, otherwise, maybe the DP goes, I know that's the way I'm gonna light it. So I'll talk to my visual effects supervisor because you don't want that to crop up with uh, three days of the grade left and, uh, and no time to kind of fix it. Uh, becomes very messy or, or expensive. Um, Which kind of links into this idea of HDR in, in, in the edit, um, you know, and that the yeah. editor is editing, looking at an HDR image, so that they're making a judgment call on that use of image, and, uh, which again feeds into this idea of where you want to be in the chain. When it arrives in the grade, you want it to be a fairly complete, uh, conformed, final storytell. And if yeah, you know, there, there are yeah, yeah there, are, there are situations where you'll get things that when they're cut together because of changing weather and light become very, very apparent in HDR. Uh, and of, of course we want editors really to go on performance, but if there are a couple of options of when they cut something, if clouds are coming in and out or lighting changes on a train or wherever it might be, um, it'd be great if they can do that. And those that I've worked with that have had HDR monitoring, um, you know, have spotted those things, but it's it's still pretty rare, uh, in my experience, that editorial are, are having HDR dailies. I don't know if you guys have, have, have seen that or if it's increasing. Paco, is, is it, do you think um, there's more HDR dailies coming through now? Well, there's definitely uh, 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 starting to be a demand of uh, doing dailies in HDR and using uh, platforms that actually can deliver um, some of those uh, files. Certainly from missions perspective, we always want to be ahead of the, of the curve and actually start to offer, offer that um, to kind of, well, tie into the demands of, of the platforms. Still, the majority is still being uh, Rec. 709. We can't really deny that, but uh, the HDR um, dailies is really going to start to pick up from now on, I guess, I think. And, and, and coming, I'm cutting back if I can to you, uh, Asa. I'm you know, thinking about um, deliverables again. Uh, um, 
you know, and we were talking about this earlier on, and it depends on what grading system you're operating on. But if you're deliverable, deliverable is if you're working on a NAM GAM, it's a NAM and VDM, no longer the GAM, you know, so the non graded archival master, the graded yeah. archival master, yeah. and the video decision master. Um, if, you know, the change now is that Netflix want to take out the graded archival master. You know, from where you are, you were, we were yeah. talking about this earlier, and you can output that non graded archival master from the base. Yeah. Yeah, the base light is our, the, 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 the tool we use to grade on and it's our final um, device, as it were, where everything is before rendering out on, um, from there. So that it will have all the fixes in, QC reports will come back to us and things will be despotted or, you know, they may go back off to VFX or to online to paint things out or do things or redo titles, but they'll come back into the base light. So that, that NAM, the non the non-graded master, which used to just be the conformal submaster, and out onto HD Cam SR, um, co comes from the baseline. So you're basically turning off various grades and things, but leaving the fixes in. Other grading systems, it's not made from there. They go back to the flame or wherever it was conformed on, which is slightly trickier because you have to make sure that both your timeline perhaps and that are identical at all times, um, and then it's output from the um from the flame in, instead um but yeah no on the base light we, that's our that's our platform we view hdr and sdr at the same time almost always the hdr grade first and then for most projects the dolby analysis and trim which we're moving on to version 4 rather than 2.9 but that's a whole, whole other uh, sort of conversation probably um and sometimes even if if you're not delivering a dolby uh sdr derived you, you might just um, use that process to, to take you on the first step uh, during lockdown when people couldn't come in and they could only view SDR on a clear view link we were using through iPad Pros I'd have to do the HDR first which is great and then analyze it and trim in Dolby for them then to start the grade as it were in, in SDR even though I've got HDR and SDR happening at the same time um, which is just another thing to, to sort of put through. But, it, but, uh, but going sorry. back and thinking that, you know, you are delivering both for HDR and for SDR, but with HDR increasingly the primary deliverable. Thinking about that and thinking about if you're on set and your primary monitoring is HDR, should you have confidence in that for the SDR deliverable as well? Yes. I mean, I mean yeah. If it's, if it's going to work in HDR, I can't see a situation it's not going to work in SDR or, or you'd, you'd miss some, I'm trying to think what you would miss or get wrong. I can't think of, can you guys, I mean, really, mm. that's why I prefer to grade that way first. Mm. Um, and even if I was actually, I'd love to grade that way first, if I was even doing a theatrical with the, with the, with the P3 sort of being the primary thing, because you will get a better balance throughout your highlights will be the same color. You'll notice if skies are different colors and brightnesses and you'll be getting those much closer. So anything after that is only gonna be more accurate. The other way around, I think it would be a lot more work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, grading is a reductive, a reductive process. Um, so it's always better to go from, you know, your original clay down to a sort of a, yeah. a model and then you, 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 you find out the details. You don't wanna be putting lumps of clay back on. You end up with something that looks like a Frankenstein. That, that's yeah, probably a, yeah. a sort of a loose analogy, but also going back to editorial as well. If you're cutting stuff and you're just looking at it at 709, you might cut things differently. If you know that you're going from a bright outside scene to a, you know, a dark scene back to a bright scene, you might reduce those cuts or you might deliberately increase them. If that's the story, you know, you're using these tools to tell the story and you don't know that they're there or you don't know the impact it might have in HDR. Then you're going to see it in the grade and go, oh my gosh, this doesn't work. And then you're going back again and recutting it. And then you're then having to regrade it. That costs money as well. Um, but also, you know, you're sitting maybe in the edit, it could be for a month or it could be for nine months. And all of a sudden you get into the grade and you've got some massive su surprises. And, there, and there's, you know, some, you can go at sort of a, the low end, you can get a, a decent sort of 55 inch uh, consumer TV. Um, so it doesn't have to cost the earth. And in a sense, they're almost yeah. cheaper than um than some of the grade one monitors but if you you, you know you can step up and get a decent a reasonably decent grade one monitor there's obviously the pvmx um to uh, 2400 or there's the um e uh, 171 if you don't mind a bit a bit, a bit of a smaller monitor um so they're, they're really sort of great choices um and, and I, I you know we really should be doing you know at least hdr at a minimum um 
and if we can dual HDR SDR monitoring right from all the way down the pipe. And I, and I know it's something that you know in conversations I've had privately with some of the streaming companies, they're they're wanting, and uh, really it's sort of uh, they're just you know waiting you know waiting for all the stakeholders to kind of come on board. Mm -hmm. um, as a company, um, a little bit of tooting our own horn. I, on a project upon on a on a poly, on a poly, I can't say it. I've got um apologies <laughs> and apologies. That's what I was trying to say. Um, we demoed like a, like you know the last BSC sh uh, show w when we were allowed to have one. Um, that that whole pipeline so that on set we showed HDR and editorial that it was possible and, and it worked. Um, and also HDR in the daily, so you could, you know, you can, you know, now with the iPad Pro and the new iPhone, as long as the the, the, the cloud platform supports it, you can do it. So there's absolutely the technology's there. There's there's no other, there's nothing stopping us from doing it other than the will to to um, to say yes, really, at that, and 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 as you know, the, the stakeholders need to understand the value of wanting to go and make this step forward. And I think, you know, it's all this kind of like seeing is believing, you know, people talk about, you know, look at, you know, I take the analogy of VR, um, you know, when you're watching someone else put on a VR headset on and you're watching it on 2D, you don't understand why everybody's going wow and stuff like that until you stick the VR headset on yourself and then you go, oh my goodness, I'm actually in this world. And HDR is kind of the same until you start seeing it and actually start working with it, you don't get mm -hmm. it. So it's it's this transition that we're struggling with at the moment where um, we haven't got this sort of uh, tipping point with certainly productions in, in, in the shooting stage where all of a sudden once you've had it, you, you then can't live without it. Um, so I, I do think we're on that cusp. I think I think I think in the next uh, twelve to eighteen months we'll see this this transition um, happen quite rapidly. And, and again, is um, you know is it is it important? Uh, and again, I'm going to ask Asa really as as the grading artist. Is it important that the color acuity, the the, the color sense, um, the color is continuous, and the color representation on that monitoring is continuous? Because when you get into your your uh, pretty much every post house in the country, you're going to find um, a, a Sony BBM X300 or HX3 yeah. there in the vast majority, anyway, certainly. So the idea that you've got the same picture and the same colours carrying through. Yeah, I mean, you do. It's become so much better in the last few years that everyone's got pretty much the same kit viewing experience. Uh, everything is calibrated constantly. The studio's pretty much dictate X300s or X310s. They want to know what your calibration, they say, these are the numbers we want you to hit. Can you confirm that? Judd offset or not Judd, you know, going through. And it's great because there are, there's no more of it going somewhere else and looking different. You know, that awful thing probably 10 years ago where every monitor was a bit different and people got really worried about things. They're not, the, the, the consistency is brilliant. That's what we need to get from the set really. That, that, that there's no shock anymore. Um, I, I mean, we have da dailies on on various platforms that are using obviously H.264s and things that are really compressed. There's always a little bit of fear at certain stages in dark scenes because things just turn to mush, um, which is then again why if they were viewing it on set more, they would look, you know, they'd worry less going through. And, and again, if I can, and the importance of test and measurement, um, you know, in prep, on set, and in the grade, you know, I'm. Um, Let's let's uh, if I can let's start with you, Paco. Again, you know, I'm, why is test and measurement so important? Well, um, it is important because um, we are talking about that. Um, well, our eyes at some point uh, triggers. We you you get used to mm. to uh, pictures or to um, the the environment, the light environment, so much that uh, uh, we obviously uh, don't see colors uh, the, uh, the same all the time. We, we are really dependent on how um, the lighting environment is. And having something that uh, actually helps us to kind of really precisely know where our images sit is um, invaluable because uh, as I said, sometimes, uh, the eyes trick you. You might think that you have uh, diffuse white set on a very specific uh, part of the image uh, for the whole show, and suddenly you you look at your leader scope and suddenly realize, oh, in this shot I just went uh, 50 nits higher, and I didn't realize it when I when I hit play, even though 
I've gone through it uh, like many times. I've checked it so many times. You sometimes really need um, the help of a scope to uh, kind of don't let your eyes trick you. And, and uh, absolutely. And, and um, from that perspective, I'm, you know, you've been using the leader scope recently. I think you, you know, um, has that made a difference to the way that you um, that you that you'll be looking at pictures in the future? Yeah, well, um, I, I really love the false color, and uh, I actually uh, once once I got it, the first thing I did was check a HDR show uh, I did last year, and actually what I've realized was was that we we had the instruction of the DOP that never go beyond 500 nits, uh, except a few key moments, obviously where we want to kind of uh, make the story. Um, well, to fit it into the story. And I was checking it and suddenly realizing that a shot that um, uh, previously uh, was at 500 nits and uh, three shots later, it was like 550. And I was like, hmm, that, that, that might be a bit embarrassing, but I didn't realize the moment I did it that I actually uh, went uh, 50 nits higher. Um, but uh, yeah. Did you um, see it visually once you knew? Yeah, what, what? Yeah, once you once you see it, you go and oh yeah, now 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 I do see it. But but in the flow, when you play it for the first time, it, it is it is tricky, especially when when we're talking about um, uh, highlight levels and uh, these uh, thresholds that now we are we're talking with uh, HDR monitors. Uh, Tom, scoping. Why why is it, why is why is scoping important to you, so, Tom? Uh, well, I mean, it's it, it's the point of absolute truth. Um, I mean, kind of reiterating kind of some of the things we said before, you walk outside and you're filming on the street and you're using, um, you know, that sort of uh, vapor lighting. Um, and then you come into a room, you're, you've adjusted your white point to that new orange and everything's going to look, you know, sort of a sort of a greeny blue. And you then sit there going, right, well, everything's looking too greeny blue. That's, let's warm it up a bit. Um, and if you looked at the scopes immediately, you would start to see this sort of like, you know, three peaks mounting. And, and you're kind of going, well, this is, you know, there's a difference between here and what's actually happening and what my eyes are seeing. Um, it, it's just that point of truth where it's telling you absolute values um, and your eye is um, it's subjective to the environment you're in, you know, how much luminance is in the room, how much background lighting there is, um, even uh, how old or how young you are as well. Um, so these, these are all um, factors. So, uh, you, you know, you, I always, in a sense, the scopes for me is always my primary reference. And then you just want to see how it looks and how it feels on the, on the screen. Um, because you're so easy. I mean, I'm, Asa does this every day, day and out. So, um, but, you know, I'm sure he's probably switching through stuff and then looks at something else to refresh his eyes every now and then because you get used to it and you can end up getting a stronger and stronger and stronger grade if you don't. I mean, maybe you can elaborate a bit more. No, absolutely. I, I mean, it's a classic thing you're doing night, which you might want very blue, for, you know, some do, some don't, uh, or an underwater sequence or whatever it might be. And if you grade shot to shot to shot and keep going, as you get used to it, you're going to push more and more and more blue into it. it just, it's just natural. So our environment is a very standard grey uh, lit with certain nit value. Um, but I, to combat that, usually just once I've got that scene, I refer back to one master shot so that I can see that, but I'll also be doing that on scopes, check that saturation level and that floor level of black. Cause it, the, the, the classic thing, highlights and lowlights, but with black is often when, um, when you do P3 first, you're doing projected because it's a lower contrast image, 1500 to one, you won't really realize the difference in your black levels very much because you don't really notice those below 60 70 code value you'll see that on a monitor uh, on a scope rather and you'll see it later on a monitor but those are the things that get, often get picked up in qc lit raised blacks crushed blacks comparing things because they will qc it through a monitor our, our qc department uses the leader scope as well but also um they're probably lifting blacks on the monitor when then it's easier to see those differences in the more noise levels change or colors change um, so yeah, monitoring is very, very important with uh, scopes at a certain stage, certainly with nit values, things that you can get very used to bright things and suddenly look over and go, I'm really about 500 nits on this. And you go, yeah, actually that is really bright, compare it to the SDR. Go, oh no, really, now I'm just enjoying the depth of it, the brightness, but that's taking me away from what the scene's all about. So yeah, that, 
that's why you have to go back and forth and insist on more time to be able to grade things and then check them technically. And that route goes from the grade that may everyone may have signed it off, but then there's that technical process through QC, our own internal QC, then to the streaming service, and then back, and then usually with the collaboration of various people within the team, we'll go through, because we'll be given FYIs, and we might want to fix those or not, and then sort of level one, two, and three on things that may need fixing, or can you, or, you know, they'll see a camera reflection in, in a mirror, and you really want to fix those. But it, it's, um, it's not finished, and well, it's not finished until it's delivered, and then it's still not finished, because you can remaster things like we did with the crown. Um, Forevermore. I told some clients that recently and they got really depressed because they thought they'd actually delivered their <laughs> it was a great show, but it was this thought that someone in a year might come back and go, Oh, we've noticed, and then they'd have to fix things after that. And I'm, I'm, I'm finally, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this. We're at the hour, so I am gonna wrap it on the hour. We almost did it, we almost did it. Um, last words, uh, Tom, last words. Uh, the importance of a of a managed color uh, HDR color pipeline. Um, why is it so important? It, you got two sentences. Um, you know, you don't manage it. It's going to be chaos. It costs money and it probably, um, you, you probably get uh, a, an undesired result at the end of it. And so, yeah, fi fix it in pre is, is the slogan. I like that. Paco. Um, well, if I have to say something, just uh, test it. Uh, just like I said in the video, speak to your colorist, uh, uh, speak to anyone that will uh, follow um, after uh, the work you do. Uh, try to develop an eye for HDR. You, you actually need to get used to how uh, pictures are, are seen in, in an HDR monitor. Uh, try to develop that eye. Uh, there are things that you are used to in SDR that uh, opens a window of possibilities uh, later on. So develop develop the understanding and develop um, uh, the critical eye that you already have for SDR, develop it for HDR. Uh, and Acer, um, I, I, you always seem to get the last word in my, in my so, opinion, uh, Acer. Uh, um, yeah, it's twofold really. I mean, one is, is get, just getting the best possible result at the end. The more you can see early on, you'll, 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 you'll achieve that easier and faster uh, and it'll be more beautiful. Uh, and also kind of just those hidden things. VFX are a classic one. Um, and hopefully they'll be viewing more and more in HDR, but it'd be brilliant from the set forward. If everyone is, it's, it's just more easy collaborative process, less worries, um, and you'll just get a better result faster. Uh, if I can, I'm gonna wrap it by saying, you know, we started on this idea of a, a managed HDR color pipeline, and it's about breaking down the barriers in my world view here, breaking down the barriers between prep as production as a siloed function and post mm -hmm. as something that happens afterwards. The word doesn't happen, post. It doesn't help rather, the word post. But it should be one joined up continuous process in which the, the collaborators are all working together with the director's artistic intent in mind. And that creative intent is at the heart of what everyone here is looking to achieve and to fulfill. Thank you to my panelists, to Tom Mitchell, uh, Paco Ramos and to Asa Scholl. Uh, always, always a pleasure to see you all. And if I can add and say, if, if you've enjoyed this, tell everyone else, it's going to be recorded and played out. We'll send out a link shortly. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Sony and Leader, and thank you to Big Pick uh, Media and to Band Pro for supporting this endeavor. We want as many people as possible to watch this. We want people to pick up on the touch points. The touch points are about how technology can support the creative endeavor and how working together across the pipeline is absolutely essential. The, the point again is not to save money, it is to spend it wisely for the best possible creative outcome. Thank you for watching. Take care, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>